Chapter 9 of Billy Whiskers at the Circus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. Billy Whiskers at the Circus by Frances Trago Montgomery. Billy Whiskers joins the circus. When the show manager saw all the performers and even the clown come running out of the ring right in the midst of their fourth act, he was naturally very greatly surprised and excited. He thought that they had all gone crazy and flew around like a hen with her head off trying to make them return and go on with their work. At last, one of them, more composed than the others, made him understand that something very unusual had happened and that they did not dare go back into the ring. Look and see for yourself if you can't believe me, he finally said. So the frantic manager pulled aside the tent flap just in time to be greeted by the shouts and cheers that the great audience gave to Billy Whiskers and the monkeys, when they saw the astonishing feats they were performing as though they were all trained to the business. That beats me hollow, fairly stuttered the flabbergasted manager. I can't understand it at all, but I hope I know a good thing when I see it, and I'm no judge if this doesn't prove the greatest feature and biggest drawing card the show ever had. The trouble will be to keep them at it right along. Those monkeys, you could see he didn't like the monkeys from the way he spoke, are about as much to be depended upon as the east wind. That big goat seems to make them toe the mark. I wonder where he came from and who owns him. There is one thing certain. This show from now on has just got to have him at any price. The manager, having satisfied himself with the way things were going in the ring, hustled back to make suitable preparations to receive Billy and his followers when they had finished their performance and came out, for he had no doubt but that they would withdraw in the same manner as regular actors, and in this, as we already know, he was quite right. The keepers and handymen were summoned from all sides to be ready to assist if any attempt at escape should be made. The best meal obtainable was hastily collected and temptingly spread out, and everything possible done to provide for the comfort of the new performers and to show how greatly pleased the manager was at their most successful efforts to entertain his audience. He very shrewdly thought that by this means he could induce them to repeat their act the next day and for many succeeding days. It is a question whether or not Billy Whiskers and the monkeys would have peaceably accepted these terms. But when they finally got outside the ring, they were all so tired from their unusual exertions that they had no spunk left to go on of themselves, much less to resist the inviting conditions which they found waiting for them. As the goat and monkeys had put in their unexpected appearance at the beginning of the last act of the afternoon's performance, when they withdrew from the ring, the audience, after a great deal of cheering and repeated bursts of hand-clapping, began to slowly disperse. The Treat family held a council of war to decide how they could best lay hold of their property, Billy Whiskers, and get him safely back to Cloverleaf Farm. Though not one of them said so, there was fear in the heart of each that this would be no easy job. While they felt sure of Billy's love for them, especially for little Dick, they had just seen him in a new and most unexpected role, and the older members of the family now more than suspected that there were incidents in Billy's earlier history that they had not even guessed at. They now knew, in fact, that sometime, somewhere, he had been accustomed to a prominent and public position, that he must have seen a very great deal of the world, 
for otherwise he could not possibly have fallen so naturally and gracefully into the trying position of clown and trick performer when so many thousands of eyes were looking right at him more than that there was the unspoken fear that the circus people might be unwilling to give up a goat who had proven himself such a wonder and had been the means of making the audience the most enthusiastic which had ever been in the great tent they might hide him and claim that he had disappeared as mysteriously as he had come or they might say that he was not mr treat's property and refuse to give him up or they might try to buy him finally the monkeys had to be considered it was evident they regarded billy whiskers whether he liked it or not as their leader and there was no telling what sort of trouble they might make if an attempt was made to take him away from them it was finally decided that the best thing to do and in fact the only course open was for the family to stick together and go in pursuit of billy by way of the exit through which he had disappeared on the back of the great black horse very soon thereafter the jubilant manager of the show was confronted by mr and mrs treat with tom dick and harry at their heels we've come to claim our property began mr treat yes billy whiskers he's my goat piped little dick as soon as he heard that voice billy whiskers who was resting near by though he had not been seen jumped up and rushed to greet his master he was so pleased to see the family that he quite forgot that he was probably in disgrace for having run away and gave every sign of his great regard for them from billy's actions it was so plain to be seen that mr treat was speaking the truth when he claimed him for his property that the circus man whatever he might have planned to do before did not have the face to question his word at the same time he had no intention of surrendering billy as the boys were just as strongly of the opinion that they would not give up their favorite playmate it looked for a time as though there would be a deadlock but the manager was very cute and he knew by long experience how to manage people both big and little had he not spent long years in learning how to amuse and please them he did not begin by calling billy whiskers a good-for-nothing old goat not worth his salt no he said that he was a fine animal the most splendid specimen of goathood he had ever seen this greatly pleased his owners for they thought the same way about billy then mr circus man went on to say how fond he already was of him and how kind he would be to him if he was his property and so by easy stages he led up to the plan he had to propose he said that he had no idea that they would think of selling the goat and that he had no thought of trying to buy him that he would almost as soon think of trying to buy little dick himself but that he hoped that they would consider allowing billy to travel with him for the rest of the season if they would agree to this billy would not only be given the best care in every way but that he would pay very handsomely for the use of him besides mr treat asked his wife and the boys what they thought of the plan while mrs treat who you will remember had always been a little suspicious of billy seemed quite willing to consider it and wanted to know what mr circus man meant by paying handsomely for billy the boys took an altogether different view of the case both tom and harry said that they did not want to part with billy at any price even if it was not for keeps while dick set up a perfect ki-yi at the very thought if i can once get the boys on my side it will be all right thought the manager he turned to one of his men standing near and told him to go quick and bring the chestnut pony hitched to his wagonette but he didn't say what he wanted of this gay little turnout the man shortly returned and with him was the chestnut pony say dick i'll give you this pony harness 
wagon and all, if you will let me take Billy Whiskers. Dick, however much he loved Billy, could not resist an offer like this. He had seen this very pony, harnessed as he now stood before him, in the parade earlier in the day, and he had thought at the time, if he only owned a rig like that, he would be the happiest boy in the world. But it never entered his head that by any possibility he might have this wish come true. When the manager saw by Dick's smiling face that he was all right with him, he turned to Tom and Harry and asked them what they wanted for their share of Billy Whiskers for the rest of the season. Tom replied promptly that he wanted a gun, and Harry said that he did too. This rather startled Mr. Circus Man, for it did not seem to him that the boys were big enough to handle a gun safely, and he expected that he was going to have trouble fixing it up with them. He talked the matter over with Mr. Treat, and soon found that he did not object to the guns. It appeared that both boys were very fond of hunting already, and had more than once been caught out with their father's old muzzle-loading rifle which was known to be dangerous. Being told not to do this, and even punishments, failed to put a stop to the practice. For this reason, doubtless, Mr. Treat welcomed this chance of getting guns of safest make and best fitted for the hunting small boys found in the woods near Cloverleaf Farm. The manager of the circus, therefore, gave Mr. Treat the money with which to buy two good guns, one for Tom and one for Harry, with a handsome sum beside which he said Mr. and Mrs. Treat were to use in getting themselves a remembrance of this day at the circus. After these arrangements had been made, the saddest part of the whole business took place, namely bidding Billy Whiskers goodbye. Of course, Mr. and Mrs. Treat did this without much fuss, Tom and Harry were so excited about the guns, which were to be bought before they started for home, and were so anxious to get to the gun store, that they came near overlooking the fact, but for Billy there would have been no guns to buy. But when they remembered this, they were really grateful, and expressed their regret at parting from their old playfellow so feelingly, that before they knew it, all three of them were in tears. By far the most touching goodbye was that of little Dick. He and Billy had been the greatest friends from the first. The big goat had drawn the red wagon with Dick aboard ever since the little chap was big enough to sit up. Never once had he run away with him or spilled him out. More than that, Billy Whiskers and Bob had saved Dick from drowning, as you remember, when he tumbled off the bank into the swimming hole down by the wood lot. So when Dick came to say farewell to Billy, it seemed as though he could not let him go, and the manager was really afraid that Dick would back out of his bargain, or, what was worse, that Billy Whiskers would refuse to stay behind his little master. But finally, Mrs. Treat took matters in hand and soon effected a parting. Tom, Dick, and Harry climbed into the wagonette behind the beautiful chestnut pony, now Dick's property, and drove away to the gun store where Mr. Treat promised to meet them and buy the new guns. Billy Whiskers' friends at Cloverleaf Farm were astonished that evening when the boys drove into the yard in their gay rig drawn by the beautiful pony. They looked in vain for Billy Whiskers. I'm going to see what this means at once, said Abby, the black cat, who, in spite of the fact that she had swelled her tail, hunched up her back, and scolded when Billy had asked her about the circus, was at heart very fond of him. She now displayed such gentle manners, purred so softly, and asked questions in such a winning way that she soon had the whole story from the pony and lost no time in telling it. The friends of Billy Whiskers held a meeting that same evening in which each one told of his very high esteem of him, 
Afterward, resolutions of respect were unanimously passed by a standing vote. They all acted as though they never expected to see Billy again. If this was their idea, they were never more mistaken in their lives. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Billy Whiskers at the Circus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Billy Whiskers at the Circus by Francis Trigo Montgomery. Chapter Ten: The Kidnappers Foiled. After his friends from Cloverleaf Farm left him, Billy Whiskers lay down to rest and think matters over. The monkeys, who had been keeping a sharp eye on him all the time, formed in a ring around him. They had no idea of letting the friend who had opened the door of their cage and whom they had chosen their leader on the spot get away from them now. When it looked as though the Treat family might take him back to Cloverleaf Farm, they had quickly decided among themselves that if he went, they would go too. This, of course, would have led to no end of trouble and confusion. Just imagine what would have happened if Billy had returned with such a drab following as that. At first, Billy Whiskers thought that he could never go to sleep with the monkeys all about him. He was not used to them yet, and still thought that they were the ugliest-looking creatures in the world. He didn't want to hurt their feelings by asking them to go away and give him a little peace. It would never do to offend them now, he thought, so he just shut his eyes and, as he had a great deal to think over, soon forgot all about them. Well, this certainly has been a great day so far, said Billy to himself. It seemed a very long time since he had stolen away from home in the early morning, and he ran over quickly in his mind the events that finally culminated in his unexpectedly finding himself at the head of a troop of amazing acrobatic performers, taking a leading part in the performance of one of the greatest shows on earth. And where am I now, went on Billy, still talking to himself. I hardly know yet. The manager evidently thinks because he gave Dick that pony and treated the rest of the family so handsomely that I am his property for the rest of the summer. Maybe I am and maybe I am not. It all depends how I am served and whether or no I like the business on better acquaintance with it. I'll try it for a while at any rate. It looks to me now as though I might have a lot of fun out of it. I have been living pretty quietly at Cloverly for a long time and I suspect that I am getting rusty and beginning to look more or less like a farmer. I am too young for that yet a while. This position will give me a chance to see no end of new places. I can get well acquainted with all the animals, and perhaps I can do something to make their lives pleasanter. I will if I can, but I must be careful never to go as close to any of their cages as I did to the monkeys this afternoon. What if it had been the lion's cage instead? There would be no Billy Whiskers here now. The very thought of it made him tremble all over. And then there is the big elephant. I wonder what he thinks of me now. I hope he saw me in the ring and knows that I really do amount to something. If not, he must suppose I am a dunce for having thought his trunk a hitching strap, and Billy giggled to himself again at the very remembrance of that mistake. With pleasant thoughts and plans like these, Billy Whiskers finally fell asleep. It did not seem to him that he had much more than closed his eyes, when he was aroused by one of the keepers who said to his helper that it was time to prepare the big goat for the evening performance, that the manager had said he was to be given a bath. At first Billy was far from pleased at being disturbed. He was still sleepy, and he felt that about the last thing he wanted then was a bath. Just at that moment he happened to glance at his right side and saw how grey with dust he was. He knew too by past experiences how much good a bath would do him. It was worth more than a night's rest, he had often said. More than that, Billy was very proud of his appearance, as we all know, and he now felt not a little ashamed that he had been seen in the ring in the afternoon in such an unkempt condition. If they call me handsome with all this dirt on me, what will they think when I am spick and span? So Billy decided to make no trouble, but to submit to the bath without a rumpus. It was lucky he did, for otherwise he would have been kidnapped and there was no telling what might have become of him. This is the way that it happened. Billy thought that the voice of the man who awakened him sounded familiar, but he couldn't remember at the time where he had heard it before. 
When his helper called him Mike, he knew in a minute when and where. This was the very same man who had been looking for him when he was hiding in the big pine box after creating such a disturbance by jumping off Jumbo's back onto the freak's platform. Not thinking that Billy Whiskers knew enough to understand what they were saying, they talked freely and made their plans while his bath was in progress. You were right, Mike, in thinking this big goat a very valuable piece of property, said Jim, for that was the helper's name. I only wish we had found him. Yes, if we had, and could have hidden him away for a day or two, we could have sold him to the manager for a big pile of money. Just think of the fun we would have had with three or four hundred dollars apiece. That pony with his gold-plated harness and the dandy wagon that the old man gave the little fellow must have cost all of that. To say nothing of the price of the two guns and the wad of money for the owner and his wife. It's a sorry day for us when we let this goat slip through our fingers. It almost seems as though he was our property now. Mike thought hard for several minutes before answering. A wicked scheme was shaping itself in his mind. You are right, Jim. He is our property. And if you will help me, we'll have him yet. I've thought it all out. It is plain to see that the old man, as you call the manager, expects you and me to take care of his nibs here, and that will give us just the chance we need. We won't lose any time about it either, for it will be easier to get away with him now than later. Tonight, when we come to load up, instead of putting Billy Whiskers in a car, we'll nail him up in a box and leave him on the station platform. You and I will stay behind with him. As soon as the train pulls out, we'll take him and start in the other direction. Later on, we can decide what is best to do. Either we can start a show of our own with Billy Whiskers as the main attraction, or we can take him to Ringling Brothers and get our own price for him. All right, said Jim, I'm with you. It looks good to me. We are both of us sick of this old show anyway. The Ringlings will hear about the Goat and Monkey Act and have to put something on to match it. It's lucky for us that they are no further away than Dayton. My idea is that we had better sell the goat and skip to New York or Chicago as soon as we can. There is sure to be a row when he is missed. I don't believe these monkeys will act for cold beans when their leader is gone. You be around handy tonight to help me box his goat ship. He'll probably make no trouble for it's all new to him, but whether he does or not, he's got to do as we want and it will be best for us to work together. Just look at him now. He is a beauty. I wouldn't believe that soap and water could make such a change in him. Yes, and wait until I have combed out his hair and beard and polished his horns, said the now enthusiastic Jim. Ringlings will give a thousand dollars for this goat, or I miss my guess. As Mike and Jim now felt that every good point and new beauty they found in Billy Whiskers meant so much more money in their pockets, you can well see why they took so much trouble to make him look his best. In the meantime, Billy Whiskers was considering the new danger that now confronted him. For several good reasons, he had no intention of letting Mike and Jim get away with him. To begin with, he didn't like either of them. More than that, the circus manager had paid his friends of Cloverleaf Farm a handsome sum for allowing Billy to stay with him, and finally he felt sure of rich food, kind treatment, constant excitement, growing fame, and a return to his old home at the end of the season. To be sure, on the other hand, the association with the monkeys was not much to his liking but as they felt very grateful to him and were evidently kindly disposed, Billy knew that he had the upper hands of them, and he felt that as long as the situation lasted, he could stand it. I'll do this, decided Billy. When it comes time to go, I will make these monkeys insist that I ride with them in their cage. In the meantime, I will tell them all about the danger that threatens me and fix it up with them that when Mike and Jim try to get me away, they are all to pitch on to that precious pair of thieves and give them a lesson that they will not soon forget. Billy laughed softly to himself as he thought of the trouble he had cooked for his enemies. There was an hour or more before it came time for Billy and his band to repeat the performance of the afternoon. He improved it by telling Colonel Blue Nose Mandrel, and the rest, of the scheme that had been hatched to kidnap him, and you can easily believe that he had no trouble in getting the monkeys to agree to his plan to thwart it. In fact, Billy had to specially caution them not to go too far. Colonel Mandrill said right away that he would fix at least one of them so that he would never try to steal one of his friends again, while the rest declared that they would see to it that the other did not escape. They all looked so fierce that Billy thought once more of old Mr. Coon's horror of monkeys, 
and remembered how he felt when old Blue Nose had him by the neck and beard and threatened to pull him into his cage even if he was smashed into a pulp in the process. Don't kill them, said Billy in a hurry, but you may scare them out of their wits. They deserve it. I'll see how I feel at the time, muttered Colonel Mandrill, and Billy couldn't get any more of a promise out of him than that. All the rest, however, promised not to go too far. By this time the moment had arrived for Billy and the monkeys to go into the ring. People who had been present in the afternoon had spread the news of the astonishing last act. Many of them had returned to see it a second time, and there was a vast crowd all told, very many of whom were interested chiefly in it. Under such circumstances, it is needless to say that the appearance of the goat and his monkeys was greeted by deafening bursts of applause. Billy, after his bath, both looked and felt fine. The monkeys, too, were rested and glad of an opportunity to repeat, with variations, the feasts of the afternoon. The manager, who had been feeling very nervous for fear that his new performers could not be depended on, was vastly relieved at the way the act started off, and his smiling face soon told how pleased he was to find that his fears were groundless. At the end of fifteen minutes, out came Billy on the back of the big black charger, followed by his weary and panting but nonetheless happy band. The monkeys did not seem to object in the least to the fact that Billy worked them almost to death. If the crowd of spectators had been enthusiastic in the afternoon, they were vociferous in their applause in the evening. Such cheering and hand-clapping had never been heard in the big tent before. It means, said the manager, talking the matter over with the treasurer, that this will be the biggest money-making season this show has ever known. Now is the time for us both to ask for a good big increase in our pay. No wonder he was pleased. Soon all was noise, bustle, and confusion. The time had come to pack up and get aboard the train preparatory to going to the next city. The question where and with whom Billy Whiskers was to ride soon came up for settlement. As he had expected, Mike and Jim were told to take care of him and to see that he had the best of everything. We'll put him in a big box by himself for tonight, proposed Mike, and after this a place can be fixed for him in the car with the Shetland ponies. All right, returned the manager, but take care that he goes through in good shape. I wouldn't take $10,000 for that goat right now. He'll be worth ten times that money to this show before the end of the season. Billy, who was keenly watching, saw Mike wink at Jim when this was said. It made him anxious, for he knew it would make them more determined to steal him than ever. During the excitement of their performance, he had forgotten all about their scheme, but now it came back to him in a hurry and he wondered if he had been wise in trusting his personal safety altogether to Colonel Mandrill and his family. Well, it's too late now to make any new plans, thought Billy. If the monkeys can't save me, I'm lost to this show. But if Mike and Jim think that they can do as they please with me, even if they succeed in boxing me up and leaving me on the depot platform, they are mightily mistaken. I'll show them a thing or two that they don't seem to know. For a penny, I'd start in right now. It seems just as though it would feel good and rest my head to butt into Big Mike, but he thought better of it and resolved to wait. By this time the monkey's big cage was standing ready for them to get into it, but not one of them showed any disposition to take the hint. Mike and Jim, who were given charge of them also, coaxed and coaxed in vain. Finally one of them caught Tittlebat Titmouse, that was the big name of the smallest monkey, and put him inside though he resisted with all his tiny might but he wouldn't stay put. Out he popped as soon as the hand that held him let him go. Finally, Billy Whiskers jumped in and all the rest followed. This delay made the monkey cage the last of all to get started. There was no need to hurry. So Mike and Jim decided that they would put off boxing Billy up until they reached the station. They felt sure that there would be a chance in the darkness and confusion that there always was when loading the cars. The box they planned to put him in was carried to the train on the top of the big cage. Jim drove to the darkest and most out-of-the-way place he could that they might the less likely be interrupted in carrying out their wicked scheme. Pretty soon after the wagon came to a halt, Mike appeared at the door of the cage. At first he called Billy Whiskers softly and seemed greatly pleased to find him laying right by the cage door. It makes it just as easy as can be, Billy heard him say. You open the door, Jim, and I will yank him out. Shut and lock it as quick as ever you can, and then help me, for I may need it. You may indeed, thought Billy. 
he could just make out to see that his friends, the monkeys, were wide awake and ready to do the parts agreed upon. The bolt was softly withdrawn and the cage door swung noiselessly open. Mike's great arm, followed by his head and shoulders, were thrust inside the cage. Billy felt himself firmly grasped about the waist and in another second he would have been dragged out and on the ground. But just in the nick of season, the long, thin arm of Colonel Mandrill shot out once more. But this time it grasped not Billy Whiskers, but the neck of Mike the Keeper. We already know from Billy Whiskers' former experience the terrible strength of old Blue Nose's right arm. Mike was learning it now. He let go Billy and pulled and tore at the thing that was tightening about his throat. He would have called to Jim, but could make no sound. He tried to pull away, but all in vain. Jim, of course, very soon discovered that there was something wrong. He crowded in by the side of Mike to find out what it might be. Quicker than it takes to tell, a dozen lean arms, big and little, had grabbed him wherever they could lay hold, and in two seconds he was as helpless as Mike. Billy did not try to interfere for a minute or two. Then he took matters in hand. He commanded Colonel Blue Nose to let go, but he did not obey. He ordered the other monkeys to drop Jim, but they followed old Blue Nose's bad example. Billy was now frightened for the lives of the two men. He didn't want to be responsible for their deaths in such a dreadful way. He reminded the monkeys that they had chosen him their leader and once more ordered them to give over their prey. At this, Colonel Mandrill reluctantly obeyed and Mike dropped limp and insensible at the side of the cage. The others followed the example of old Blue Nose and Jim fell by the side of his pal in no better condition. Billy and the monkeys might now have made their escape. They even spoke of it, but were all of the opinion that they were being treated too well at the time and the prospects of fun were too good to think of taking such a step then. They agreed among themselves that they might consider the subject later on if things did not go to suit them. Presently Mike began to collect his scattered senses. They laughed in the cage when they heard him grunting and groaning. Just then he evidently touched Jim, who was also coming too, for they heard them whispering together. It would seem that they were both thanking their lucky stars that they had escaped with their lives. We'll have to give it up, Mike was heard to say. Those monkeys are sure holy terrors, and they will never surrender the great goat. I know there's big money in him, but he ain't for us, Jim, and Jim agreed. Someone was calling them to hurry up with the monkey cage, and with more grunting and groaning, they got to their feet and drove up the inclined plane onto the car. Soon they were rumbling along to the next place where the great show was to exhibit. Billy Whiskers, in the cage with the monkeys, fell asleep wondering what the coming days could have in store for him. End of chapter 10「Billy Whiskers at the Circus」by Francis Trigo Montgomery Chapter 11 – The Wreck Billy Whiskers now fairly launched on his career in the big show that made him more famous than ever before. From the lordly way he ruled the monkeys, he was soon everywhere known as King Billy, though he never liked that proud title as well as plain Billy Whiskers. It was not long before the billboards were covered with life-size pictures of himself and his troupe. When he gazed for the first time in his life, but a short time since, at those wonderful show pictures at the corners, he little dreamed that he would ever have such an honor. The circus manager was quick to see what a drawing card Billy was, and of course made the very most of advertising him far and wide. On the whole, he liked his new life. The grand parade on pleasant mornings was always a delightful experience. Looking his very best, he rode on the back of Jumbo, the great elephant. Billy and he were soon the best of friends. At the head of the procession, while his monkey band, who were always imitating his example when they possibly could, rode on the backs of the other elephants. How the crowds shouted and cheered and laughed as they moved by. It was all music in Billy's ears, and it seemed to him that he could never tire of it. The afternoon and evening performances furnished two more opportunities each day for Billy and the monkeys to show themselves to vast and always admiring audiences. The manager of the circus was never better pleased than at his great luck at having secured such an attraction. It was proving, as he had foretold, the best-paying season in all the long and successful history of the great show. For this reason, as one can easily see, 
he made things as pleasant as he possibly could for Billy. Both he and the monkeys were furnished all the time with the things that they liked best to eat, and nothing was left undone that could add to their comfort and enjoyment. The circus man felt in his bones that King Billy was a very independent person, who might at any time, if things did not go to suit him, kick out of the traces and there was no telling what might happen then. The monkeys, without him to lead them, would not be worth their salt as actors. There had been convincing proof of this one day, when Billy was so sick that he could not lead them into the ring on account of having eaten too much ice cream with chocolate dressing the night before. The audience was so disappointed that there came near being a riot and great many demanded their money back. After that, great pains were taken with Billy's diet and his health was most carefully guarded. Mike and Jim continued to have the care of Billy. After their first experience in trying to kidnap him, described in the last chapter, they never attempted anything of the sort again. As a matter of fact, they soon became very much attached to their charges and took a great deal of pride in seeing that they always looked their best, both when they were on parade and when they entered the ring. A rival circus sent two desperate characters to try and poison Billy because he was drawing all the money and their business was very bad in consequence. Mike caught these two fellows putting Paris Green in Billy's salad one night. With the help of Jim, he held them both until assistance came and the would-be murderers were turned over to the police. When the manager heard of this, he complimented the keepers on their watchfulness and doubled their pay. Billy was grateful to them, too. He forgave the attempt they had made to steal him, and after that they were always good friends. During the summer, the big circus visited the large cities and towns of most of the western states, going as far as Denver, Colorado. It then turned eastward once more, and Billy began to feel that he was homeward bound. This made him very happy, for he had not forgotten or ceased to love his old friends at Cloverleaf Farm. While he liked the excitement, high living, and luxury of his present life, and had become very good friends both with his keepers and with many of the wild animals in cages whose hard lot he had always tried to make pleasanter, still they were never to him quite like home folks. There was nobody who took the place of little Dick, he knew by this time that he could never again make so dear a friend. Then there were old Bob, Abby the black cat, the bay colt and other horses, Big Red the fierce bull and his wives, and for spice and variety, the thievish old coon down in the big chestnut, not forgetting Polly Parrot, sharp and snappish though she certainly was. Billy was beginning to think of them all more and more often, and the wish to see them and be with them again was growing greater day by day. While spending a Sunday in St. Louis late in September, he addressed a letter to his friend Bob at Cloverleaf Farm. As it presents very clearly his frame of mind at this time, and throws many sidelights on his circus life, it is here given in full. St. Louis, Missouri, September 27, 1908 Dear Bob and other home friends, I hope that you have not been thinking that because I ran away to see the circus at Springfield without saying goodbye to every one of you, I do not care for you. If so, you were never more mistaken in your lives. It cost me a great deal of pain to do as I did. You little know how much real grief I felt the evening before I started when I went around and called on you all. I did not forget how you had taken me in and befriended me when I was poor and hungry and sick and lame and alone. Nor was I then or shall I ever be unmindful or ungrateful for your great kindness at that time. No, dear Bob and all the rest of you, you made a friend of Billy Whiskers then who will be true to you as long as he lives. Nor must you think that because I have not written to you before this summer that my new business and friends have driven you out of my mind for even a little while. How often I think of you all, and every day I wish more and more that I was with you once again. As you have no doubt heard, it has been a great time for me. I wish you could see what I have to do every day. You would be proud then that Billy Whiskers is one of your acquaintances. They tell me that I am famous and I judge that such is the case for the way the crowds cheer every time they see me. Don't think that I have become vain and conceited when I tell you that I was never looking so handsome and distinguished as now. Owing doubtless to the great quantity of rich food that I eat daily, I have put on more flesh, which improves my figure. Both my hair and beard are longer, whiter and silkier than ever before, while my horns and hoofs are manicured daily. I try not to be proud and stuck up and never lose a chance of doing a kindness for the wretched wild animals that are shut up in their cages month after month. 
Just think how dreadful their lives must be. I wish I could tell you all about them, but I haven't time now. Wait till I am home again, then I shall have many strange tales to tell about the lions and tigers and wolves and bears and all the rest. Some of them are so ferocious that even now the sound of their deep voices makes me tremble. Speaking of home reminds me that the time is not now far distant when I shall be with you once more. Only the thought of it makes me very happy. There is just one thing that keeps bothering me. I do not know how I am ever going to get away from the monkeys who have chosen me their leader and declare that they will never leave me and that I shall never leave them. While my success in the show business is very largely due to them, and I can have no doubt of their fondness for me, I may say to you, but I must never tell it, that I have never been able to like them very much. I do not forget the dreadful fright they gave me at first. It's a long story and I can't stop to tell it now and I just expect they would treat me in the same way again if they suspect that I thought of leaving them. They are certainly the worst-looking creatures I ever saw, and some of their manners are a little short of disgusting. I shall have to be very sly when the time comes. This letter is already too long, though I haven't told you half of what I want to. I hope that little Dick and the boys are well, and that the chestnut pony is not entirely taken my place in their hearts. With best love to all, Sincerely yours, Billy Whiskers. P.S. Keep your eyes peeled and you will see me some bright morning before long. From St. Louis, where Billy Whiskers wrote to his home friends, the big show moved steadily eastward. By the latter part of October, it was once more in Ohio, and not so very far from Farmersville, near which you will remember Cloverly Farm is located. On the night of the 13th, when the show train was running between Hamilton and Zanesville, a head-on collision took place which threw most of the cars containing the animals off the track and down an embankment, piling them up one on the other in the utmost confusion. The frightened and tortured beasts, as well as their keepers, made the most fearful outcry that was ever heard. For a long time the people who came to the rescue were afraid to approach the wreck lest a lion or a tiger or some other man-eating animal might find his cage burst open and make his escape killing and devouring everybody that came in his way. Fortunately, Billy Whiskers and the monkeys were not killed or badly injured, though terribly shaken up and frightened almost to death. As soon as Billy collected his wits and began to look about, he discovered that not only was the car in which he was riding smashed open, but that the jar and upset had shaken the pin fastening the door of the big monkey cage out of place so that it was easy for him to get out. Now is my time, he quickly decided. I can't do any good here, and while this racket keeps up, I can get away. The monkeys are too scared and dazed to see what I am up to, and they will not think of following me now anyway. As good luck will have it, I am not very far from Cloverleaf Farm, and I know I can find my way there. So he stole out of the overturned cage and car, picked his way as noiselessly and quickly as he could through the ruins, and started on a dead run for the protecting cover of a woodlot which he discovered not far off. It was not so dark but that he could make out his faint outline. All unknown to Billy, there followed behind him a silent procession of dim and quiet figures, twelve in number. They were the monkeys pursuing their leader. When he reached the wood, Billy stopped to rest and take stock of his plight, whereabouts, and plans. Like shadows, the monkeys quickly gathered in a circle around him. Now Billy Whiskers began old Blue Nose in his most dreadful tone. Will you please explain to me and my family what you mean by skipping out with no word to any of your band? Well, we may never have told you in so many words, you know very well what sort of punishment we reserve for a deserter. Speak. Although Billy was startled and had great difficulty in finding his voice, he was sharp enough to know that his fate now depended on lulling the suspicions of the monkeys. So he said, Colonel Mandrill, Tittlebat Titmouse, and all the rest of you, I was never so glad in my life to see anyone as I am you now. I observe that you have all escaped that frightful wreck unhurt. After the collision, I was so shaken to pieces and frightened, while the din was so ear-splitting, without thinking a thing what I was doing, I started and ran. As you have seen, I stopped just as soon as I came to a safe place. Before now, if you hadn't come, I should be on my way back to hunt for you. I hope I may be forgiven for that tale, added Billy under his breath. The older monkeys whispered together for a short time, 
evidently trying to decide whether or not this plausible story was to be believed. Although it was manifest that there was a difference of opinion, the majority were in favor of accepting the explanation as true, and this decision was quickly made known to Billy's great relief. I've just been thinking, then said Billy, that we will never have a better chance to escape than now. We are not a great many miles from my dear old home at Cloverleaf Farm, which I have told you about so often. I think I can find the way. If we are agreed to the plan, I will try and lead you there. This proposal led to another consultation, and while not very enthusiastic about it, the monkeys shortly said that they would go. As no time was to be lost, they started north at once, keeping in the shadow of the woods. A nice time I'll have introducing this crummy-looking crowd to my friends at Cloverleaf, mused Billy. I wonder what the coon will say. The very thought made him laugh. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Billy Whiskers at the Circus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mary Balmer. Billy Whiskers at the Circus by Francis Trigo Montgomery. Home Again. By this time, it was about three o'clock in the morning. There were two good hours before daylight, and the time was improved by traveling as fast as possible. Billy and his party kept within the woods wherever possible, the monkeys, for the most part, staying in the trees, leaping from one to another, which is the way they get about in their native forests. They can travel much faster that way than on the ground. They all enjoyed the freedom they were experiencing for the first time in years very greatly and were in the best of spirits. The racket their chattering made was so loud that Billy had to caution them about it for fear they might attract attention, and this they did not want to do. It was easy to imagine what was sure to happen if anyone discovered that there was a drove of monkeys loose in the woods. The whole community would be quickly aroused, and a big hunt started. By all means, discovery of this sort must be avoided. As soon as signs of daylight began to appear in the east, Billy looked about for a good place to hide during the day, where they would all be safe and could rest in peace and quiet until night came again, when the journey could be resumed. So it happened that they were at this time following a course of a little river which ran between steep banks of great rocks. Billy's sharp eyes soon detected an opening between two of these large enough for him to go in. So in he went. To his surprise, this opening grew in size as he advanced until shortly he found himself in a dark cave as big as a large room. There couldn't have been a better place for them to spend the day. A little brook ran through the cave so that the supply of good water was abundant. It was plain to be seen from the bones scattered about that sometime this cave had been the home of wild animals, probably wolves or bears, but there were no signs of recent occupation. So Billy was not disturbed by any fears. Going out, he hastily summoned the monkeys and told them of his fortunate discovery of a good hiding place and bade them to lose no time in getting out of sight, as it would soon be broad daylight. This they did in a hurry, Colonel Mandrill leading the way. You might suppose that by this time they must have all been very hungry, and so they would, but that on their way during the night they had passed through many fields where there was plenty of corn and pumpkins, through orchards where the boughs of the trees were bending beneath their weight of beautiful, ripe apples, 
through cabbage patches and fields of turnips. All the time they had helped themselves to everything they wanted. If they were not hungry, they were certainly tired. The excitement of the railroad wreck and the unusual exertions of a two-hour's tramp were enough to bring weariness even to the youngest and friskiest of the monkeys. Soon it was quiet in the cave, except for the snoring of Colonel Mandrill, who never could sleep quietly. Evening had come before even Billy Whiskers, who had the responsibility of the expedition on his hands, roused from his deep, refreshing slumbers. He supposed from the silence all about him that all the others were still sleeping. As it was dark in the cave, he could not tell whether it was day or night. So he thought he would slip out and take a look around when he could decide whether or not it was safe to start out. With this wise plan in mind, he made his noiseless way very nearly to the entrance of the cave when, for the last time in this story, the long arm of Colonel Mandrill darted forth and nabbed him hard and fast. No, you don't, Billy Whiskers, for I have caught you again. It is my belief that you have planned to sneak off and leave us here by ourselves. If I really thought so, I'd fix you here and now, so you could never play us such a trick again. What have you got to say for yourself? It's no such thing, answered Billy, mad through and through at this unjust suspicion, but scared at the same time. I was just going out for a minute to see what time it is. The cave is so dark that I can't tell anything about it. If you don't believe me, you can come too. I will, grimly answered old Blue Nose. Outside they found that the sun was already down and that it was fast growing dark. Billy Whiskers and Colonel Mandrill agreed that it would be safe to start as soon as the other monkeys were awake and ready. I think, said Billy, that this little river here is the Tuscaroras. If so, I know my way and we shall have no difficulty in finding Cloverleaf Farm. By traveling fast, if we are not stopped or hindered, we should be there by three or four o'clock in the morning. With that encouraging prospect before them, they started in good spirits. In a surprisingly short time, it seemed, Billy Whiskers began to look about for familiar landmarks. In the distance to the left, he discovered a group of buildings which he made out to be the corners where he had first learned about the circus and seen the billboards. A little later, he saw and recognized the big chestnut tree where Mr. Coon lived. We'll make for that, thought Billy. If the old marauder is out and comes home to find a lot of monkeys perched in his tree, he'll think he is having the worst nightmare that ever horrified a healthy coon. How I shall laugh at the sight of him. Billy didn't dream of the tragedy he was about to witness. Soon they had come to the big chestnut tree, and the monkeys, without being told, quickly climbed into its lofty branches, waiting for Billy to decide on the next move. While he was considering how he could best put in his unexpected appearance at Cloverleaf Farm. He thought he saw two figures of what seemed to be small boys hiding behind a clump of blackberry bushes not very far away. They came shortly after he arrived and evidently did not see either him or the monkeys. He was right for Tom and Harry Treat had come out with their guns to try and get a shot at Mr. Coon, who, of late it seems, had been very bold and had acquired the very bad habit of robbing the hen roost at Cloverleaf. Only the night before, he had imprudently selected for his midnight supper 
the finest young white leghorn rooster on the place. This was the more provoking, because the boys had expected to enter this same rooster at the county fair to be held the next week. The coon had now gone too far in his depredations, and it was decided to put an end to him at whatever cost of time and trouble. This explains why they were watching with their guns at this time of night, the old chestnut tree, where it was well known to be the coon's house. Presently, a scratching inside the trunk of the tree might have been heard, and very soon the head of the ill-fated coon appeared at the door of his house. He crawled lazily out on the great limb near at hand and was about to scratch himself as was his wont, when he espied one of the monkeys. He couldn't believe his own eyes, so he winked hard and looked again. Instead of one, he now saw a whole group of his arch enemies, here and there and everywhere, all silently watching him. Colonel Mandrill, the nearest to him of all. With that, he closed both eyes and toppled off the big limb to the ground. Just then, two shots rang out on the still air, and at the same time, both Tom and Harry rushed forward to make sure that the coon did not even yet get away. He was dead. There could be no doubt of that, but no mark of a bullet was found upon him. At the unexpected sight of the monkeys, his old and most dreaded enemies, he had perished of heart failure. While the boys were wondering how it was that the coon had died while the bullets from neither of their guns had touched him, to their increased amazement and utter astonishment, Billy Whiskers appeared before them, coming from the other side of the great chestnut trunk. On the part of each there was every indication of joy at the unexpected reunion. In the meantime, the monkeys had climbed down from their lofty perches and, according to their custom, silently formed a circle about their leader and his friends. When the boys saw them, they thought that wonders would never cease. It would be too much to say that they were not a little frightened at first, but as soon as they saw that Billy Whiskers took it as a matter of course, and recognized who the monkeys were, they invited them all to come with Billy to the house, assuring them of a cordial welcome. On the way, Colonel Mandrill told Billy that the wicked coon had doubtless died of heart disease, brought on by the sight of him and his family, and explained that this same coon had traveled with their circus three summers before, and that he had been placed in their cage and that they had no end of fun with him. Of course, went on the colonel, the more he hated our teasing and the crosser he grew, the better we enjoyed the sport. Finally it appeared. Old Ringtail, as the monkeys called the coon, had made his escape just in time to save himself from nervous prostration. They had never expected to see him again. By the time the story was finished, they had reached the barnyard. It was then between five and six o'clock of the beautiful October morning. The animals were just beginning to move about. Billy Whiskers was so excited that he could hardly contain himself. The first of his old friends he encountered was old Bob, the big Newfoundland dog. Their happy greeting was most enthusiastic. Like wildfire, the news spread that Billy Whiskers had come home, and all his friends rushed to welcome him. They were all present, including Mr. and Mrs. Treat and Little Dick. What rejoicings there were! Even the monkeys were treated well on his account, though it must be confessed that it was with difficulty that aversion and suspicion of them were concealed. Mr. Treat said that they would soon learn all about it. In this he was right, 
for the city paper brought in by the rural delivery man that day gave a full account of the wrecked railroad train and told how, in the hubbub, the famous Billy Whiskers and his trained monkeys had escaped. In another place, there was a big announcement offering a reward of $2,500 for the safe capture of the runaways. Mr. Treat, without telling any of the family, at once drove to the nearest telegraph office and wired the manager that the lost animals were all safe at Cloverleaf Farm. The following morning, the circus man with Mike and Jim appeared on the scene. It was soon arranged that Billy's engagement was considered closed. Owing to the lateness of the season and the serious wreck, the show would at once go into winter quarters. The only difficulty was to induce the monkeys to go, leaving Billy behind. It was finally decided to build on the big lumber wagon a strong removable cage. When finished, Billy, to whom the scheme had been explained, jumped in at once, and the monkeys followed. At the other end of the cage, two of the bars had been fixed, so that one of them could be dropped down and the other raised up, thus making a hole big enough for Billy to get through. When all the monkeys were in, Mike and Jim made the opening for Billy, and out he popped before the rest knew what was up. Then they made an awful outcry and tore around like all possessed, but it did no good. Billy got out of sight and sound as soon as he could, for though he did not love the monkeys, and they were more mad than sad at parting with him, still, on the whole, they had had good times together and been a great help to each other. I feel about parting with the monkeys a good deal as I do about old Mr. Coon, though I know he richly deserved his fate. It makes me blue to think about it. It was a disgrace to be an acquaintance of his, but I can't help admitting that he was often entertaining company. It's the same way with the monkeys. With the reward money received for the return of the monkeys to their owners, Mr. Treat bought one of the automobiles that were then just beginning to be introduced for use in the country. This pleased the boys greatly. Beside that, he put a thousand dollars away to be used for Tom, Dick, and Harry's education when they were older. And so, for the present, we will leave Billy Whiskers at home again, more admired and famous than ever before, enjoying, as he had never done in the old days, the peace and plenty of Cloverly Farm, surrounded by a host of good friends and many interests. The End End of Chapter 12 End of Billy Whiskers at the Circus by Francis Trigo Montgomery